Hi, everyone. Welcome back to MTRA Bedtime Stories. Well, tonight is our last chapter in Justin Morgan Had a Horse. I'm so relieved that Joel found him. I was just so worried about that horse, and now he's in the right hands. So let's see what happens. Chapter 18 is titled Justin Morgan and the President. Joel had never known such warm and glowing happiness. He worked on Little Bub not only with hands and mind, but with heart and soul. While Little Bub slept, he walked around on tiptoe so as not to rouse him. Then he could hardly endure the waiting for him to wake up. No human patient ever received more tender care. To coax his appetite, Joel prepared streaming mashes of oats, and he thinned them with linseed tea for quick strength. He ground corn in his own grist mill, flavoring it with slices of crunchy carrots or rutabagas. He put a chunk of rock salt in his oat box where Bub could lick a dozen times a day if he had a mind to. At first, the horse only licked the food that Joel prepared and let it dribble from his mouth. But in a matter of days, he was eating because he could not help himself. The soft mashes were so delicious, and they required scarcely any chewing. He was like an invalid who wanted to make up for lost time. He ate and ate while Joel looked on in delight. As for drinking water, Little Bub could not seem to get enough of that either. The teamster had expected him to eat snow or to break ice in a stream. But Joel warmed a bucket of water by the fire and enriched it with oatmeal. In every move of Joel's, there was life-giving warmth. In the rubdowns with his woolen mittens, in the flannel bandages that he wrapped about little bub's legs, in the melted sheep's fat with which he bathed the cracked hoofs, and there was coziness, too, in the way Joel tucked a fleecy blanket about him, pinning it in place close under the chin and belly. It was like magic the way the little horse began to be himself again. His eyes livened and his coat lost its harshness and took on a kind of luster. In time, even the ribby look disappeared and the hollow places at his flanks filled out. All Randolph began to notice the change. I declare, men said, Justin Morgan is spry as a grasshopper. One early morning, some six months after he had found little bub, Joel cornered Mr. Chase between piles of lumber in the mill yard. What I feel about Justin Morgan, he said, and then he could not go on. What is it, son? Joel reached out and peeled off a splinter of wood, shredding it with his fingers. What I feel, he bursted out, is that he ought to march in the big parade when the President of the United States comes to Vermont. The miller laughed. Well, you and me ain't going to argue about that when it's to be done. A fortnight away on the 24th, sir. Where at? Burlington. Burlington? The miller took off his hat and scratched his head. Why, that's way up on Lake Champlain. Must be a good 50 mile as the crow flies. That ain't no distance for a stout-hearted critter, sir. He can do it easy. Mr. Chase smiled at Joe. Of course he can. The Morgan's fine and fit as any horse in his prime. Anyways, I reckon you can decide, son. He's all yours. Joe's laugh was deep and happy. Why, so... He be, then he added, all the riflemen who served at Plattsburgh will be there too. And maybe Joel hankers to polish up his buttons and be among them, eh? Maybe so, but sir, can you spare me? By the great horn spoon, I ain't no Methuselah. You go, son. What's more, you see to it that Justin Morgan is spang up there in front where President Monroe can see a horse what is a horse. Two weeks later, on that sunlit morning of July 24th, there was a special kind of excitement in the air. In a pasture in Burlington, Joel was currying little Bub as if his very life depended on it. Never before had Bub been groomed this carefully. It made his skin tingle and his blood race with well-being. When his fetlocks had been trimmed and the hairs on his ears and whiskers about his chin, Joel stood back in admiration. There, he said with a final pat, you even look like a parade horse. Do you know, he gazed into the liquid brown eyes, 
you've just naturally grown young. Your heart be young and so be you. In all the 19 states, I bet there ain't a finer horse. Now you graze, feller, whilst I suds myself in the creek behind the willows. Joel's bath took far less time than the horses. Then on with the green coat and the white breeches, which had been washed and patched until they looked almost as good as new. Now they were both ready. Now it was precisely 11 o'clock, precisely the time to set out for courthouse. As Joel rode up to the meeting place, his troop of cavalry was already gathering. A shrill whistle pierced the air, then column of twos, the marshal of the day shouted as he pumped his arm twice and held up two fingers. Joel turned to look at the soldier beside him and broke into a grin. It was none other than the shoeing smith. As the columns moved forward, it seemed to Joel that the Burlington had turned out to watch the parade. A solid sea of people lined the streets from the courthouse to the college green. They began cheering the colors, cheering the sh soldiers, and kept on cheering because they felt big and good inside. Joel, too, swelled out his chest as if this were more happiness than he could hold for his little bub was surely the finest parade horse in the world. He acted as if he had been bred and born to parade. He answered the slightest pressure of Joel's knees. He kept in line obediently. On command, he walked backward. He walked sideways. And always his feet kept time to the beat of the drums. Now they were approaching the president's stand. And from the church tower, bells began ringing, all softly solemn at first, then wild and merry until they sang up to heaven itself. President Monroe, tall and erect, stepped forward on the stand, while a statue of guns shook the very earth. Many of the horses tried to wheel or bolt, but Justin Morgan didn't flinch. When the guns quieted and the bells stilled, the people, too, felt silent, waiting. The president removed his hat and held it across his heart. His eyes looked straight ahead to the platform across the street. There, two hundred children in crisp pinafores and calico suits were on their tiptoes, ready to sing the new song, The Star-Spangled Banner. Now, into all that great quiet, a pitch pipe sounded, and at a signal from the teacher, two hundred treble voices sang out, Oh, say can you see, by the dawn's early light, what so proudly we hailed, at the twilight's last gleaming. The president beamed all during the anthem, and when it was over, he bowed and clapped at the fine performance of the school children. Then mounting a horse held in readiness, he rode between the columns of cavalrymen. Halfway down the line, the horse suddenly ducked his head between his legs. A bee had flown into his ear and was driving him frantic. He snaked his head along the ground, and he reached up with a hind foot to scratch the buzzing thing away. It was all the president could do to dismount. The foot soldier had to lead the half-maddened horse away. Take my mount, a colonel offered. Take mine, take mine, voices went up on all sides. The president smiled and shook his head. He let his gaze travel up and down the columns as if he would continue his inspection of foot. But then his eyes fell upon Justin Morgan and stopped there. He looked at the bright, intelligent face and motioned to Joel to ride him out of line. For one awful instant, Joel could not cluck or tighten his legs or jiggle the reins. Every muscle seemed frozen, but at a good-humored nod from the president, his fright was gone. He leaped to the ground, and while a little murmur of surprise rippled down the columns, presented Justin Morgan to James Monroe, President of the United States. At first, the little horse eyed the man in the tall hat as if he were the one to do the approving. Then, apparently satisfied, he bulged through his nose those high, quavering notes followed by a deep, snorty rumble. It was almost as if he had said, I'm glad to meet you, sir. How the people roared in delight. It was like a storybook the way the Morgans seemed to understand the greatness of the occasion. He stretched so that the president could mount with ease. Then with Joel walking proudly behind, he moved on with lofty cadence action. When the procession reached the college green, the president rode to a little knoll. 
it faced a natural amphitheater, which was already filled with people sitting and now with the followers of the parade standing. Colonel Totten, mounted on a white horse, was on the knoll too. He raised his hand for quiet. Ladies and gentlemen, his voice boomed low and strong, the President of the United States. A great hush fell. It was so still and respectful that a feeling of admiration for these people welled up in James Monroe. He was fingering the sheaf of notes in his pocket, but suddenly changed his mind. This was no time for talking from notes. This was a time for talking from the heart. With one hand holding the reins and the other resting lightly on the Morgan's crest, he began. Fellow citizens, this picturesque scene is associated in every bosom with our highest honor of our country. The gallant action on your Lake Champlain bound the Union together by ties as strong as bands of steel. A burst of applause filled in the little moment while the president took a breath. No nation has a richer treasure than liberty, and I am proud of the way American liberty was defended by the Green Mountain Boys. You, citizens of Vermont, are as firm as the mountains that gave you birth. May the bravery shown here ever animate your children to follow the glorious example of their forefathers. A thousand Vermonters cheered and threw their hats into the wind. This was a speech they liked, crisp and to the point, with no big-sounding words. The president smiled and bowed. He could not remember when he had been greeted with more hurrahs. In the midst of all the rejoicing, Justin Morgan took it into his head to bow too, and now the crowd went wild. It was hard to tell whether the Morgan or the president was the hero of the day. The president dismounted, gave Justin Morgan a friendly pat, smiled his thanks to Joel, and handed him the reins. Half of the throng now followed the president down to the shore of Lake Champlain, where a steamboat waited to take him to Plattsburgh. But the other half swarmed around Joel and Dustin. There were professors from the college and tradesmen and all kinds of soldiers and old ladies and young ladies and boys and girls who now fumbled in pockets for good things to eat. They all wanted to go home and say, I, I in touch the president of the United States, but I really did feed the horse he swung up on. Some of the very farmers who had once poked fun at the Morgan's long tail were now trying to snip a few hairs for a souvenir. I always knew he'd be a go-ahead horse, they crowded. Then, right there on the college green, questions began popping like sparks from a dry log. Who is the Justin Morgan horse, anyway? Who was his sire? Who was his dam? In the midst of the din, a white-bearded veteran from the Revolutionary War shouted for silence. You folks be too young to remember, he bellowed. But one black night during my war, a fancy English thoroughbred of the name of True Britain was hitched at a tavern near the British lines. Then along came a Yankee, and what did he do? What? Horse crowd. Why, he stole that there British horse and raced him across the lines, and twas him that sired Justin Morgan. Sorry to contradict you, Grandpa, a young man broke in, but to my eye, he's got the build of them stout little pacers from Narragansett. You're wrong as a pump without a handle, chirped a little cricket of a man. He's a Dutch horse if I ever see one. Begging your pardon, interrupted a very old lady. I have learned from a good source that he's French-Canadian. The talk uh, seesawed back and forth, first about the little Morgan's pedigree, then about his birthplace. In the heat of the arguing, the chewing smith rode up to Joel and motioned the crowd back. Ladies and gentlemen, he announced. Joel Goss here is the onlyest one who knows about this horse. He, my friends, can answer your questions. A silence came over the gathering as all eyes turned to Joel, who would rather have fought another battle than speak to such a long group. For courage, he put an arm around little Bub's neck and twined his fingers in the glossy mane. A sprig of evergreen from the horse's headstall fell to the ground just then, and at sight of it, Joel thought of the Green Mountains and of his trip with the schoolmaster so long ago. The inhaled words now came slowly like raindrops from a tree long after the rain has ceased. When I was knee-high boy, 
he said, taking a deep breath. Our singing master, Justin Morgan, took me with him to visit Farmer Bean down in Springfield. What's Farmer Bean got to do with it? The same white beard veteran barked out. About everything, Joel explained. You see, he owned the master, a lot of money, but he didn't have any. Go on, the crowd urged. We're following you. Well, the farmer didn't want to be beholden to anyone, so he gave the singing master a fine big colt named Ebenezer, and for good measure, he threw in a mite of a colt called Little Bub. And that Little Bub, Joel paused, smiling awkwardly. He be the one who took on the schoolmaster's name, Justin Morgan. Go on, young fellow, the old man prodded. You're doing fine. Well, the schoolmaster and Farmer Bean both be dead now, Joel said, restoring the piece of evergreen to the horse's head stall. And likely nobody will ever know who was this fellow's sire and who was his dam. He was just a little workhorse that cleared the fields and did what was asked of him. Joel's face suddenly lit up as if he had thought of something for the first time. He spoke now to the horse as though he were the one that mattered. Why come to think of it? You're just like us, bub. You're American. That's what you are, American. And that ends our story about Justin Morgan had a horse and how the Morgan breed became what they are. If you don't know much about Morgans, you might want to look up some information. They're quite a nice little breed of horse. And so they are considered our American horse. So everybody, stay safe. Get a good night's sleep, and I'll see you tomorrow.